We're getting it. We're getting it live and kicking. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we're uh yeah, we're working. We're working on this. We need a um definitely need a like secretary kind of assistant, kind of Richard Pierce kind of assistant. Yes, we do. Hallelujah. But Thank the Lord for his grace and mercy. We're uh, we're here. Amen. <clears throat> and, uh, yep, we look like we're a little crooked, but we'll try to get this straight. And we'll see how that works. Um, <clears throat> hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. For all that he is, all that he does. Yeah, forgive my, uh, my mess here. Um... My daughter was here earlier, and she was supposed to get that Avengers movie, but she left it. Um, I got my copy. Yeah, enough there. Oh, uh, um, you definitely want to. Oh, did I do that? I did. You definitely want to see some of these Bibles I've gotten man, over the past couple of days. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He provides so my buy Bibles. When the Lord provides, I buy Bibles. I'm thinking about um, this fellow, and uh, uh, let me get this plugged in, get this thing up and running, and see how this works. Oh, isn't this nice to be prepared? It's great to be prepared, right? Or to be an example of preparedness. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> uh, cook, my goose is cooked. Yeah, not prepared. I don't know. It's uh, it's just um, a lot of times I do this off the cuff. I see things that um, I say, well, okay, <clears throat> I think this would be a good topic. And then uh, I bring it to you. Um, yeah, so I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to do it. Um, doing it, I wish I could do it like I started out wanting to do it on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you saw how long that lasted, right? Um, everything changes from day to day. Uh, of course, you know, I have everyday life here in this world, and uh, I have, um, uh, I've been on house watch for the past week. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Thank the Lord, though. Um, everything went well there so far. Got to get uh, another um, homeowners association is coming over to interview me. So they want to talk about, you know, all this. And we want a new homeowners association. We want someone to come in and get, get rid of Rebecca Park. We're done with these people. So, um, yeah. Um, and, uh, um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for God's grace and mercy. I'm thankful for the way that he does what he does. Um, yeah. And so, uh, hallelujah. Pray, pray, pray. Hallelujah. Homeowner HOAs. If you have the opportunity to buy, uh, a HOA run condominium, don't <laughs> just don't. Um, thank you, Jesus. No, but for her, hallelujah, it was worth it. It was worth it. I stuck with it for her. Um, it was her house when we met for nine years. And uh, let me get this real quick. All right, we got that sound down. Now, um, amen. Um, hallelujah. And uh, yeah, I think you're all set. Pastor Josh is in the house already. That's good. Yeah, bless the Lord. I'm figuring probably between three and six is the best time, you know, for everyone. Uh, the West Coast people, you're uh, about one, 145 now. And, you know, you're rolling on with your afternoon. Josh, you're probably working in the office. Um, and... Uh, yeah, um, I, uh, 
I'm, my day is pretty much done. I'm still waiting for my car. My car, they haven't called me for my car yet. So my car's been in the shop for two days now. All right. So I hope that uh, it's not going to cost me too much. I didn't expect to have to invest any money into I was gonna just buy a truck as soon as I got that money for the truck I was just gonna buy another truck and spend about you know I don't know spend it all on another vehicle but no nah, I needed the money I needed the money it helped carry me through and I got a good vehicle in the process the uh the car as far as the engine and everything, the way it runs, it's a great vehicle. I got a good deal. Just need some locking devices fixed. Gotta fix my locks. Thank you, Jesus. Yep, I need to be able to lock my car, right? Amen. Hallelujah. So um, we're looking at this guy here. <clears throat> this is the um, the Dominic Enyart show, it's called, I think. Uh, irrelevant. Um, it's not about him. It's about um, not what he says, but how he says it. That makes a difference. Um, so I always tell people, you know, it's not what you say most times, but how you say it, that makes a difference. You know, how we say what we say to people, like you have something really burning your heart, man. And it's like, you want to tell somebody this because you know God's speaking, but how do you do it? You know, well, you think about, um, you think about, um, you know, ministry passages, classic ministry passages, right? Um, what's that? Okay. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, Timothy, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, and uh, Paul was talking to Timothy, and I'm going to break this baby in here, this is the new one, this replaced my green goblin, I never got a sufficient replacement for the green goblin until now, this is a Skylar PSC, this is a great Bible, nice, personal size Canterbury. That's King James, and I'm happy. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, my green goblin was an NAS, but uh, oh, yeah, you seen what happened to that one. Uh, Skylar Bibles are the best built Bibles in the world. Buy a Skylar Bible. If you have the money, buy a Skylar Bible. Hallelujah. Um, hallelujah. Uh, let's see. Paul said um, in, is it second? Thessalonians or 2 Timothy uh, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. There it is. I just had to say it once and it rolled right off my tongue. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. Paul says to Timothy these words. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you bless it to our spirit. Um, help us to understand your words so that we can apply it to our lives. And thank you, Lord God, for teaching us how to be um, the leaders that you've called us to be. Um, help us to remember the responsibility placed upon us, Lord God, who desire to be um, teachers. Um, I know we're going to bear, Lord God, uh, a heavy load. Father, have your way. Help us to teach the truth always in Jesus' name. Mm -mm. It says, um, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, Paul says these words to Timothy. Now remember, Timothy's a young pastor, right? So Timothy's going to be, um, um, he's being taught, and he says, um, he says, uh, and the servant of the Lord must not strive or be quarrelsome, right, so there's a difference between being contentious and earnestly contending for the faith, how are you, how can you defend the faith, earnestly contend for the faith without being contentious, right, we do this, but we don't do this to be contentious, um, it got to the point where I was falling into that contention and somebody pulled my coat, you know, Colin got, you know, he's got the, the bat phone, he got on the bat phone and called me up and said, Pastor Brett, and then I said, thank you, brother, God bless you, man, appreciate it, I received it, you know, it's not what you say, but how you say it, 
And you know what he did? He gave me about 20 scripture references that told me don't do it. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't. I even removed the post. I removed the comment that I had sent to Jonathan Burris and uh, I just removed it. I left the video up that I did about him, um, but uh, I'm not gonna keep pulling down live streams every time I say something that might offend somebody else. I just have to remember what I'm saying to you. And I don't always, sometimes I forget, but this is a truth that God shared with me a long time ago. And, and for the most part, hallelujah, we live by this, right? This is a call to counselors for sure. And he says, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, right? Ready, willing, able, whenever called upon, apt, always ready, right? To teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, right? I wasn't coming in meekness. I was coming with guns blazing. I was getting ready to rip them up. I even told them, you know, something <laughs> Don't want to mess with me, man. I'll give you a spanking. Um, no, that's not the way God wants me to do this, though, right? And so, um, but, uh, oh, if, if you see, you just get a whiff of the arrogance of these, some of these, these younger people on YouTube that just are so unteachable. And they just know that they know that they know that they know. And they're not listen. They don't listen to anyone. They just gonna tell you how it is, and, and that's it. Because you know, I was there. Now I'm here, because I was here, but I went there, and now I came back here. Right. So, you know, talk about the version debate, right? And so that's how that went. But I, I, I need to remember this, right? And it says we're supposed to be doing this in meekness. Um, Mark Ward's a pretty good example of that, but he doesn't all the time, you know, he fails at it too, just like all the rest of us do, you know, and, you know, calling people, uh, absolutists and onlyists and, you know, uh, just, you know, you group everybody together and, um, Nick takes offense to that and I'm not offended by it, but I get it. I get it. I, it bothers me, but it doesn't bother me. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't put labels on myself to begin with. So I don't, it just kind of like goes in one ear and out the other for me. I'm thankful. Um, we're supposed to what be meek. And then if perhaps God would grant them who are the people that we're ministering to repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And the way the modern critical text changes the end of that portion of scripture is ridiculous, but I'm not even going to get into that. Um, and so, you know, you have, uh, you have the word clearly telling you um, that you should present whatever you're presenting in a spirit of meekness, whenever you're trying to reach out to somebody that's opposing themselves, and which what I was trying to do. When I first started out with the young man that did, I went to him, you know, trying to just encourage him. But when he came out with his snappy, you know, everybody's a King James only nut, rough midnight wing nut, and I don't care what you believe, uh, if you believe in the King James version only, we're coming for you. And I was like, oh, oh not again. You know, yeah, okay. So, um, hey, Jeannie, thank you, Jesus. How are you? Nice to see you. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen, Jeannie. Thank the Lord for his grace and mercy. So, um, yeah, amen. So, uh, um, we, uh, you know, we, we, we have to be aware, right? Amen. What we say how we say it so listen to this kid now i want you to listen to this and this is how we should not right this is what we should not do listen to this what he does he's talking about james white 
and the uh, his debate between him and this barber fellow and how James White took a beating, da 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 da. Um, watch. That's a pretty accurate description. The Gospel Truth, that's a Calvinist YouTube channel. I've appeared there in the past for debates on the topic. And even a Calvinist leaning audience seems to agree that Tim won pretty handily, right? 57% we see there. Even lifelong fans of James White are admitting that, hey, Tim won the debate. And so how did James lose the debate so badly? Well, there are a number of reasons, but primarily because James used the same tried and not so true arguments against open theism. Recall that the topic is, does God know the future exhaustively? And there's two primary positions to this debate. The first is the Calvinistic view that God has exhaustive foreknowledge of the future with 100% accuracy and deviation from his foreknowledge and eternal decree is impossible. The second view is the open view that God... Impossible. <laughs> How do you get impossible when you're talking about God? Where does impossible come into the conversation? When you're talking about God, everything is possible with God. Um, our understanding is what the problem is, right? It's your understanding. It's our understanding of the word. Now, you notice I always say ours, right? Why do I say that? Because I'm there too. I'm still learning to, I'm still growing to, this guy is all of what, 25 maybe, ripe? And, you know, <laughs> and he's got it down. He knows it. Um, I'm not your five point kind of uh, follower of the doctrines of Calvinism. I don't use the term. I don't identify with John Calvin. I'm a Christian. I identify with Jesus Christ. He's my absolute identity. I read the word, I study the word, I'm a Christian first, foremost, right? Calvinist, Arminian, I do follow the doctrines of Jacob Arminius, or I follow the doctrines of John, Cal I don't follow, I follow the Bible. I live with the Bible, I know what the Bible taught me. I, he, he, he's, was it him? Or someone else said, no one can ever come to the understanding of Calvinism by reading the Bible alone. <laughs> and I said, what? I don't even know what it was that said it now. But I really just wanted to rip into that, and I didn't. Um, um, and what I learned about God's free will choice, or God's sovereign direction and man's free will choice, and which one is it? Both. They're both in Scripture. They're both in Scripture. And I've shown you how you can understand it. It's easy. It's simple. It's not confusing. The Bible is not confusing. God allows us to choose right from wrong, good from evil, up from down, front from back. He allows us to make decisions in life. He foreknows what's going to happen. And you can't change that. It's going to happen. He foreknows it. He foreknew it before you and I were born. And yet he still called us, right? What do you mean he called us? He said, yo, and you heard the preacher and you turned and you said, hmm, and you turned the channel on and you said, wait, wait a second, what's that guy's name there? Hmm, preaching the gospel, huh? Hmm, who is that? Pastor John MacArthur. Hmm, I want to watch that. And so you start watching. And what do you hear? You hear the gospel, right? You hear the good news about Jesus Christ and you need to repent and be born again, right? You need it. You hear the gospel and you received it. Why? Because God put it in you to listen to it. God puts it in you. It's that faith from Christ. It's a faith that God gives. It's not something you put in him. It's something he gives to you in order for you to understand him. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. To, of, from it's from God, right? Not in God. If it's in God, it's something you got to put in him. Change modern English. Uh, Bibles change it to in. But it's not in. It's from. 
It's the faith that God gives you before you even know him. He called you. He knew you before you were born, right? That's what he said to Jeremiah, right? Do you think that's not applicable to everybody? It's applicable to everybody. The Bible calls us the elect. Why? Because God foreknew you before you were born. Therefore, you are, right? You can't understand that. So what? <laughs> I, when I couldn't understand it. I said, okay, hallelujah. But I believe it because you showed it to me in your word. And I get it. So, you know, read Proverbs 16, 1 and 9. And you read it and you see, oh, God does it. It's all from God, but he allows us, right? And say, so, what, uh, Joshua 24, 15, right? What does it say? God, what, gave us, what, choose you this day, right? Whom you shall serve. So you choose, right, to serve the Lord. You surrendered to him, right? And you did, you did, you did it, you did it, you did it. But he foreknew you would do it. Hallelujah. So he called you and made sure you got there. That way, that time, made sure it happened. That day. My wife got baptized on our wedding day, and he made sure all that happened. And the day before our wedding, she got cold feet, and she got into a big fight with me. That Ah, I was going to go leave. I was going to be done. We were going to be done. I was going to walk away. And she asked me, please forgive me. And she stopped me from walking away. And we got married the next day. She got baptized, and now the rest is history. 20 years later. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, so I'm thankful. God is amazing. God is amazing. This woman that was Roman Catholic all of her life never read the Bible. She worked in a Baptist church when I met her for 18 years. She was there for 18 years, and she didn't know Jesus. In a Baptist church, I said, man, that pastor ought to be ashamed of himself, right? He was gone when I got there, and there was some new guy there, and he didn't last long, and then another new cat, and then a couple of just passing by, and then we used to get the interim preachers, and I was there for the last eight years of her tenure with her maintaining the building, and uh, yeah, it was uh, something, man. It was something. Amen. Hallelujah. What do we got here? We got Michael Chandler, Keaton. I am a Calvinist because of the Bible alone. Amen, Mike. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But I don't like the term Calvinist, Mike. I just don't use the term Calvinist. I don't have to identify with John Calvin. I want people to know that I'm a Christian. I identify with Jesus Christ. That's why I've never used the term Calvinist. I believe in the doctrines of Reformed theology because Scripture, biblically, you know. But I believe the difference between me and, like, James White is the difference is foreknowledge. Pragnosko in the Greek. Romans 8, 29, 1 Peter 1, 2, Pragnosko. Because God foreknew, therefore you are. It's simple. He's the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy, right? The Bible is prophetic from Genesis to Revelation. Revelation is a fulfillment of what he says in Genesis. Everything started there and ended here. And, right, it's God foreknew all along the way, everyone who would, who would not, he foreknew. He didn't make them. He doesn't make us. He doesn't force you. God's not a divine rapist. He doesn't force us to do anything. He allows us, right? The divine, what is it? Is it, is it um, divine decree? Is it God's decretive will or his permissive will? See, I believe in his permissive will. I believe what it says in Job, why, why the devil was coming in, getting in the conversation with the, what's the devil doing here? I thought this was the angels and God, and we're talking. And, and here all of a sudden, you know, Job's getting his, you know, life just taken from him. He got raped. Job got, he was done. Crazy, Right? Who did it to him? God? No, God didn't do it. God allowed it. Who did it to him? The devil. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not change. He does not do evil. He allows evil. Satan does evil. Satan, Jesus said, is the father of lies. He's the founder of sin. He's the one that was in the garden tempting Eve, right? He's the one that attempted it. He's the one. 
Satan did it, not God. God foreknew what would happen, so he allowed it. Why? Hallelujah. You and I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for Jesus. We wouldn't be here. So I'm thankful that God foreknew what he was doing. I'm thankful that he knew what he was doing and that he, he allowed it to be done. He allowed it to be done. He allows it to be done right now. What's going on in the world and this craziness that you're seeing online all the time. And why? I mean, God allowing it for a reason. Got to fulfill. Jesus told John, can suffer it to be so now for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Everything has a perfect purpose in this life. And it's not over. The story isn't over because Jesus hasn't returned yet. Jesus hasn't returned yet. There was the rapture of the church yet. It ain't happening yet. It's not happened yet. So it's not over. We still got a lot left to tell, right? And we might be in the last days. We might not. They thought they were in the last days back then. And Peter was preaching and, you know, they said, where's your God now? You know, you say it's been like this. And, and Peter said, man, it just keeps happening. I mean, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but it just, it just keeps going. And here we are, you know, 2,000 plus years later, and we're still going. What's up? It's his time, right? Not ours. It's in his time. When you think about it, if a day is as a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years is truly as a day with the Lord, then the last 3,000, 4,000, 5, the last 6,000 years have been six days. Hallelujah. And that's something. Um, watch the Jewish clock. Watch the Jewish clock. Keep an eye on the Jewish clock. You got to keep an eye on the Jewish clock. Why? Keep an eye on the Jewish clock. Because six is the number of destruction. Seven is a number of completion, right? So when the seventh millennium begins, when the seventh millennium begins, right? We're going to have completion, right? And then the eighth millennium, let's say after the millennial reign of Christ, will begin the eighth millennium of life and right recorded history. And what will that be? New beginnings, right? New beginnings. So I believe that, you know, the thousand year reign of Christ here on earth, which the post mill people think is happening right now, by the way, because they don't define millennium as a thousand years. I'm sorry, the Bible does Revelation 20 verse four, but they say it's not, you know, it's just, just a period of time. Okay, whatever. So throw out first Thessalonians four. And throw out Revelation, because after all, you don't need it with the Post Mill Gang. Doug Wilson. Yay, Doug Wilson. Um, I don't know. I question all that. I really do. I question all that because they know that this doctrine came along in the 50s and again in the 70s. And now here it is again. And it's come in different names. Abolitionism, the social gospel, and now post-millennialism. Really, guys? Come on, you don't get it? Are you serious? Wow, you fell for it. Greg Bonson, man, fell for the stuff that dude taught, man. And it's amazing, too, because Jeff Durbin is an intelligent young man. I'm surprised he fell for it so easily. Um, gotta be more meek. Watch his kid now. Watch what he does, and, and you'll see, you know, what I'm talking about as plans for the future and that he establishes his plans and brings them to pass, but that literally not every single detail is part of God's plan. And so which parts are open and which parts are settled? Well, under the open view, there's some deviation, but as a rule of thumb, sin is not part of God's plan. So it is a wicked Calvinistic teaching that God planned out every single atom of the universe, its course, throughout all time and space where it would wicked Calvinistic teaching. Want to see why I don't use names? Um, my, I don't use like Calvinism and Arminian. I don't use those terms. I'm a Christian. Born again, Bible believing, Bible preaching Christian. Or be even 
you know, including during crimes, during sins, stuff like that. And so when a man rapes a little girl, every single tensing of that man's muscle, every tensing and loosenings of his muscle fibers as he's restraining a little girl to rape her, all of that down to the atom is part of God's decree, his foreordained plan under Calvinism. And that little girl is going to be raped. So now this is where I agree with him in that, you know, God doesn't do that. You can't, you can't say that. And James White says, yeah, God did that. God did that. That's that divine decree stuff. I don't believe that. I don't believe that nonsense. God didn't divinely decree every sin ever was taking place in the world. That's madness. That's madness not going to happen. I'm not believing that. I don't believe that. God is not wicked. God allows it. He allowed Satan to do what he did. He allowed people to do what they did. He allowed it for a reason. I'm thankful, man. I'm thankful God allowed me to do the things I did when I was a kid because I wouldn't have learned the lessons that I've learned in life if I didn't do the knuckleheaded stuff that I used to do, you know? I was a maniac. I was running around. I was a fighter. I just a violent person. I wasn't you know, um, but, um, but that was bad enough, right? You know, that was bad enough. I used to hurt people for money. I used to love it. Um, and that wasn't a sport. Trust me. It wasn't no sport. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Oh boy. The stuff we used to do, man. Oh my Lord. God. Hallelujah. Um, I'm thankful. All right. So he points out this fact here. This is getting beyond what I really wanted him to show you. Exactly how God decreed that she would be raped and exactly how God wanted her to be raped and what way that rape so, would bring God the most glory. That is what Calvinism teaches no, because Calvinism is an all-encompassing everything. Ev now that, 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 that's where him and so many other people who are against the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of reformed theology. This is how they think. This is why they think, because they hear this and then they just parrot it. Okay. That Calvinism, you know, decrees that Calvin, John Calvin didn't teach that stuff. James White doesn't get that from John Calvin. I've read the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Okay. I read it from time to time. I love reading John Calvin's right. John Calvin was a beast. I love John Calvin. He had his issues. So what? Do you have no issues? Because if you have no issues, I want to know you. I want to know you because that means you're the Lord. Hallelujah. You got no problems, no sin issues. Yes, I want to know you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so um, yeah, he he's um so at any rate, listen. A single detail is foreordained by God. And so the open theist view is a much more humble, you know, okay, maybe not every detail, not everything is part of God's plan. Maybe sin especially is the opposite. It's a rejection of God's plan. And so the Calvinists, they're going to have a difficult time winning this debate, point in case with uh, James White, they have a difficult time winning this debate because they cannot just point to a single event and say, yeah, so um, he, uh, he went past, I went past this, um, where he, uh, he got into this like slanderous other side and to the audience in debates. I know this firsthand after my dad's debate with James White, James White put out a video calling him a cult leader and me going to his church, I would be a cult member. So he's not especially been respectful. So now there's a personal issue involved. You know, um, I, I still don't know who his dad is. Um, I'm going to have to look it up. James White debating and he debated his father, who um, must have been opposite Calvinism or Reformed theology, if you will. Um, so he's got a personal issue with James White. 
listen to him, you can hear in the past, he does that consistently. This random guy commented on Twitter, what I find most disrespectful is how you talk about your debate opponents after each one, you're nowhere near as convincing as you seem to think you are, but somehow your confidence and your performance is always unabated, not very edifying. And I think that's a pretty accurate description. The Gospel Truth, that's a Calvinist YouTube channel. I've appeared there in the past for debates on the top. So, and again, he, um, he just got, you know, he went in on James White. The debate, and so clearly he's confident about it. He's promoting the debate. James, on the other hand, he recently posted this on X, and this is okay, not this. especially encouraging. Thanks to everyone who came out or watched online tonight's debate. Pretty disappointing on many levels, but hopefully still useful despite that. I will be establishing a new rule for all future debates. Seriously. And so he adds parentheses seriously in there because he knows that what he's about to say is a little odd. It's a little, it's a little odd. It's a little like people will be caught off guard by it. They'll think, well, why would you have to do this? So he recognizes that this is a little bit weird, but he says, if you must read your opening statement, fine. However, rebuttals and closing statements should reflect the actual debate as if it was taking place. Pausing here as we'll see, Tim Barber, he successfully predicted what all of James White's arguments were going to be, and he came prepared, and so James was upset about that. Having your rebuttals and closing statements written out beforehand simply means you are not debating. You are just there to make a presentation that will be interrupted by the other guy once in a while. I mean, so far, so good now, right? It's okay. I, I get it. You know, so far, so good. He's... Um, He's doing a, a good job of, you know, um, presenting the uh, the issue here, presenting James White's stuff, whatever. It's okay. I get it. James White isn't, you know, my favorite. I'm not a James White fan. You know that. I don't follow James White. I used to. I used to follow him. I used to follow his ministry, but I don't follow James White. I get it. But oh, watch what he's about to do. That's not debating. If you can't listen, take notes, and interact, most people can't do that, then maybe you should reconsider doing debates. By the way, as you would see if you watched the, the video, Tim, as he was debating, he was taking notes, he was writing, and of course he did have pre-written notes before the debate that he referenced, that he went back to, but he did do exactly what James is describing there. He says, Flowers did it to me twice. Akin did it to me twice. Tim Barber did it tonight. There won't be a twice. It's disrespectful to your opponent, to the topic, and to the audience. And so this is somewhat discouraging to hear this from James. He's kind of throwing Tim under the bus because Tim came prepared, and the consensus is that James was not quite as prepared as Tim was and so it was just, it was a little bit messy. There's been a lot of people commenting the opposite, saying essentially, no, James, it's pretty much you who's disrespectful to the other side and to the audience in debates. I know this firsthand after my dad's debate with James White. James White put out a video calling him a cult leader. And so I, I'm, I guess I'm missing the part where he called James White all kinds of jerks and everybody you know, he's calling everybody a jerk, but um, the, uh, the um, you know, the kid, you know, went in on James White. He went in on James White. He ripped him up. And that's just not, I don't know, it's not the way I want to do things. I want to do things differently. I want to, I, I want to, I want to, you know, address the issues at hand without having to, um, you know, pull a Steven Anderson, start kicking the pulpit and screaming and throwing you out the door or, or uh, you know, um, I don't know, creating some, you know, dirty debate tactic because uh, I know you're, <laughs> you're, you're picking me apart here. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's why, you know, he's done 200 moderate, moderated debates and, Everybody else gets one or two, maybe four or five in there. You know, you might get some that are seasoned. 
Um, I don't get the debates, repeated debates. What's up with the repeated debates? You know, um, I don't get it. What's up with the repeated debates? Um, the debates about uh, um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church again and again. How many times are you going to debate Trent Horn on popery or Marian worship? Or how many times are you going to debate Trent Horn? I get it. You know, after a while, isn't it just for the money? The notoriety, you know, Dr. James White, all these people are coming, get some books out here, sell some books and make some money. And the church is going to pay you, of course, for coming. And of course, we're going to ask everybody for a big donation, because after all, he's traveling across the country in his RV that we supported, you know, you know, so I get it, you know, um, how many times are you going to do that? I'm thankful. Um, he um, he needs uh, he needs to um, debate in order to make sure. So we go right back to this debate that he did with the barber. Um, man, my boy Nick was out there this morning. I didn't get to stay long. I had to leave. I had to go in. Um, uh, shopping with my baby one of my daughters came over and so I had to go shopping um, and then uh, um, she took me over to the store to get my medication and stuff uh, I was watching this uh, um, here and, and I don't know if you've ever seen this program this is uh, Cody Bobechko and Bible Discovery Hey everyone, welcome to Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. Is amazing. My name is Corey, and I'm here with my husband, Matt Lock. Her and her husband, Matt Lock, and they do this. They go through all of the stuff they talked about all week long. And then, um, yeah, they're really good. I love, I love their, I love her ministry, but they're, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, um, so, yeah, there's, uh, here it is. The debate. Now, this is the actual debate between James White and Tim Barber, and we talked about it a little bit, but um, Tim Barber did exactly what he was supposed to do, um, and James White got frustrated with the kid because um, the kid was talking too fast for him. Apparently, if you talk really fast, you get James White all thrown out. <laughs> off topic he gets off topic um he loses it when people talk fast um but tim barber uh did a good job what did i miss not much Colin. we're just talking about this young man that was going in on james white um and uh, i just want to talk about you know what it is we should be doing you know what should we be? what shouldn't we be doing we shouldn't be you know, um, calling people jerks because we don't like the way that they, what? Or we don't like their doctrine. Um, I don't ever, I never, ever, ever, um, I never read anything about Calvinism until my doctrine was solid, sound, secure, you know? Um, I believe I, you would probably label me a four-point Calvinist. That's how I've been labeled. Um, I don't care. I'm a Christian. You know, and people want to know what I believe, and I explain it to them. And it's simple. It's not difficult to understand. Open up the scriptures, and I'll show you. Um, and we'll look at it. And I can tell you, you know, what the Word of God says. Um, and then tell you what I believe about it. I'm not going to, if you don't believe it, God bless you. There's people, all kinds of people on YouTube that believe what you believe. Go over there and believe right along with them. Um, a lot of people will stay and want to debate with you, you know, because it seems like everybody wants to debate online. It's a big debate. Everybody wants to debate somebody. Um, and if you debate somebody online, especially on YouTube, you get 
to be well known and you get to be noticed and and then people what might call you and have you come and speak at their church i don't know uh i'm still like i don't know i'm still winging it with youtube <laughs> i feel like i'm just scratch the surface sometimes um yeah so uh I, kudos again colin thank you man i mentioned uh you earlier um thanks for you know the advice um i took down all that stuff that i wrote on that young man's site and i pulled down my comments and my challenge is to um, debate him because I, I don't want to do what I'm telling you not to do. I don't want to get into, you know, arguing um, about doctrine when I'm supposed to be preaching the gospel, right? I'm supposed to be preaching the gospel. I, I always say um, I'm not here to win arguments. I'm here to win souls, right? This is what I've been called to do, preach the gospel so that people that don't know can hear and then they can confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart, their mind that God raised them from the dead, then they'll be saved, right? So you have to what? You have to hear first and then you have to confess and then believe and then you're saved, right? That's the pattern. That's the process. That's the way that, you know, it, it is, it should be done. And so this is, you know, um, biblical salvation, you know, and there's a human choice involved. How can you not see that? I see that. I see that. That doesn't mean God isn't sovereign. That means God is allowing it because he knew you were going to get saved on that day. <laughs> it's so simple for me. It's so simple for me to understand. I'm so thankful for the privilege of knowing what the word of God says, you know, and when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, it's God. God's the one who saves. God's the one who, uh, he's the one who, who saves and who, who, who justifies and who glorifies. He's the one who does it all, right? So it's not us. It's all about Jesus and not about us. I'm thankful. My late evening cup of coffee. Hallelujah. Reaction videos, critiquing and poking holes, and uh, the back and forth, those videos are a dime a dozen, amen. Before I was saved, I watched debates, um, then I got saved, and so the debating has a bug in my craw. <laughs> I've been feeling convicted in my watching of all these debates. Uh, if I'm still watching the same stuff, um, just on the other end of the spectrum, has anything really changed? Be a Christian, not a critic. Yeah, yeah, I, you can, I guess you can, you can have that um, attitude, um, you know, if you believe that God is, you know, telling you not to be involved with it anymore, but there's, there's a certain place for it, but there's a time and a place for everything, right? The scripture says, right? What's the time and place? Is it all the time? No, it's not all the time. There is a time and a place though. Um, um, if I'm getting paid to go around the country and I got a ministry um, account that's filled up with a whole bunch of people because I got 20,000, 30,000 followers, not to mention, you know, all the, it, that man could have said whatever he wanted during COVID and they wouldn't have done anything to him because after all, he's got 20,000, 30,000 followers and they just can't beat that. They can't beat that. And they're afraid to say anything to anybody that has a voice. He has a voice, He's got a powerful voice. So, um, you know, but me, they slapped the cuffs on me, man. They told, they gave me a warning and they said one more time and we're going to shut you down. And I was like, well, I'm not going to shut up and not tell the truth because I got threatened. No, but someone said to me, someone on the channel said, Pastor Brett, um, your videos are very helpful to many, many people. And, and you weren't 
you always say you weren't called to be a politician. So why not just leave the politics alone and just preach the word? Um, because that's, you know, what you should be doing. And sure enough, you know, um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Hold on one second. Let me make sure this isn't... Okay, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, it's just a neighbor. All righty. So, at any rate, um, this, this young man here, the Enyart fellow, I guess his father debated James White. And James White uh, um, said some things to his dad, and oh, he's still having issues with James White. Um, mm. What are you going to do? So, uh, hey, man, I'm not trying to bandstand, just trying to find that balance. Yeah, hey, man, Colin, I get it, bro. I'm not, uh, I'm not. Um, now, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, you had a question about Isaiah 26, and I can't remember the passage. Isaiah, I thought it was Isaiah 26, and we talked about it briefly, but... Um, I was looking for it. So what was that passage in Isaiah, Colin? It was 26. I know it was 26. I just don't remember the verse. And the question, I remember, but I don't remember the verse. So I don't know. Am I still, like, live and kicking? <laughs> Sometimes I don't know. I can't tell. There's a there's a lag in between my um, in between my computer and my. Um, I'm still holding a cup of coffee on my screen. Now I just put it down. Now I'm getting up and walking out the door. In my screen. So. Yeah, I had to put my fan on a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, so verse 14, and it was deceased, and verse 19, dead. So as Isaiah 26, 14, and 19, um, yeah, and it uh, says, that, and they are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Yeah, I mean, so what's the question? Because really, you know, it's like um, verse 14 and 19, you can see them both right there in verse 14. And then 19 says, uh, the dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise, awake and sing ye that dwell in dust for the dew as the dew of herbs. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about that, and I believe that it was prophetic of either the resurrection of Christ from the grave, or remember the resurrection of the dead bodies coming out of the graves at Christ's crucifixion. Because remember that, right? Christ's crucifixion there were Matthew 27. Look at it, Matthew 27, right? You go to Matthew 27 and you look at Christ's crucifixion and you see these words. And this is, I love this because it's important to understand, you know, what was going on there. There was something happening here, man. And it's like powerful because it's like, whoa, wait a second. Um, my grandfather just came out of the grave, man, to preach the gospel to some people. I was sitting there going, putting some flowers in, and Grandpa popped up out of the grave. <laughs> I probably would have freaking fell over dead, man. Uh, my father popped up out of the grave while I was planting flowers. 
I mean, just, I mean, you know, it just, it's just, imagine being there and seeing that, seeing dead people rising up out of the grave and going into the city and preaching. There was crazy things happening when Jesus was crucified on the cross. The spirit realm and the natural realm were coming together. Hallelujah. There was such a cataclysmic event in heavens when Jesus died on the cross. It's crazy. Um, and you have to know that there's something real happening here. Um, um, and Jesus, um, it says... Uh, Oh, let's see. He was mocked by the soldiers. It was Matthew 27 and it said, uh, here, Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, right? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. Man isn't doing that. It's impossible. It was a six-inch thick piece of curtain. They weren't tearing it to begin with, but it ripped from the top to the bottom, right? A bolt of lightning, maybe? God's lightning is precise. He can direct a bolt of lightning and pop a chicken in a basket, you know, with a, no problem, you know? Um, you think our, our technology is better than his? Hallelujah. Um, but the Lord... He says, uh, when he cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. That doesn't mean after. That doesn't mean following, because then, you know, somebody might say, well, what does that mean, after? That means meta, that means in the midst or in the likeness of, in the likeness of. So just like his resurrection, so these people were coming up out of the graves, right? And it says they were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And they came out after or in the likeness of his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with them watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, this was truly the Son of God. You know? And so, I mean, that happened, and I think that, that Isaiah reference was prophetic of that one event right there. Could be more, could be both. There could be a dual role. Prophecies are known to have dual roles. Um, an example is uh, the prophecy about uh, um, the king, uh, um, oh, it's in Isaiah, it, it, the prophecy ends up being about Satan in the spiritual realm, Isaiah 14 and uh, Ezekiel um, 28, uh, both passages um, together show you what happened in heaven before Adam and Eve, you know, before, you know, God created man, there was a battle in heaven and Satan and God were going at it and, and then Satan dragged a third of the stars and those were the angels, one third of the angels and he dragged them and he cast them down to the, and then Satan was cast down and yeah, so, um, where was Satan with Job? came along when when the whole job story was going down we were saying uh walking up and down to and fro in the earth he said to and fro back and forth in the earth i'm walking up and down in the earth wow really yeah why because he was confined there right not in hell in on the earth satan is on the earth he's still on the earth his demons are reserved in hell those Angels that went down with him. Yeah. Now he has more minions, obviously, since all of that happened. He's obviously been collecting souls along the way, right? So he's got, yeah, you know, he's Charles Manson's definitely a, you know, follower. He's a demon. He's got to be a demon child. Um, so, I mean, you know, look, um, 
Hallelujah. I'm thankful, man. God is good. I know that. I trust him. I know his, I trust his word. That's what we do, bro. We get into the word. The word in the Hebrew is Rephaim, uh, which is a breed of giants. What deceased, um, the Hebrew word is Rephaim, which is a breed of giants. Um, and so deceased um, would, uh, you know, uh, what, I, I don't, I don't know what Rephaim, I'd have to look at it and see why they translated it, um, deceased when, uh, Necra, Necros, Necros, I think it's Necros is the, uh, um, yeah, um, Mm, I'm trying to, that's, that's the Greek necros. I'm thinking of, um, yeah. Um, mm, 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 mm. Let me look at it. All right. So let's say, um, no, I can't do it there. I can do it here. Let me see. Okay. So I thank the Lord for my wife's phone. I still got my wife's phone. I love it. All right. Um, let's see, what was that? It was, uh, verse 14 and 19, and, uh, it was, uh, Isaiah 26, 14 and 19. Okay, Isaiah, uh, 26, uh, 14, and deceased. Yeah, let's see. Um, we're not coming up with that. I want that one. Do I want that one or do I want this one? Where's the other one? Okay. Um, this is... Yeah, uh, Repaim, Repaim, um, Repaim, and uh, uh, it's dead spirits. It's a gloss. It's a dead spirits. Um, it's a noun. It's common. It's masculine. It's plural. It's absolute. Um, Repaim, Repaim, um, just simply um, dead spirits, deceased. So I don't know how you got um, breed of giants out of that. I don't know how you got breed of giants out of Rephaim. The I am is plural. Whenever you see the I am at the end of a Hebrew word, it means that it's plural. So it's talking about many, not one. All right, so we're talking about dead spirits, deceased, dead spirits people that are just dead and remember something the Jews believed in soul sleep just like uh, um, Jehovah Witnesses believe today and yeah um, but um, I'm thankful um, hallelujah amen thank you Jesus hallelujah so amen hallelujah so I don't know what, um, what's going on here. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Okay, so yeah, I, I don't get it. So um, so you got, uh, that's my confusion. Other places are Isaiah 14, 9, Job 26, 5. Um, okay, so if uh, the word in the Hebrew is Rephaim, which is a breed of giants, yeah, but that's not true. So the, the word Rephaim doesn't mean a breed of giants. It is just dead spirits. I don't see I don't see breed of giants. I don't know where you got that from. If you got that from a modern critical text, um, you know, dictionary or the OED Mark Ward loves using the Oxford English Dictionary. I don't care about the Oxford English Dictionary. I don't look at it. When I study a biblical word, I study Hebrew or Greek. 
I don't look at English dictionaries. I don't, I don't look at English dictionaries. Why? Because that's what King James onlyism teaches. That's what rookies do. They tell you, they teach you, get the Webster's 1828 English dictionary. That's all you need to understand the truth, brother. You know, no, no, stay away from the English. When you study the Bible, don't even bother looking up the English word. Because then you're going to be like Mark Ward and like, you know, all the other modern critical text people that run to the world to find out what the word is saying. Get the Hebrew, get the Greek. How do you do that, Pastor Brett? Get a Strong's Concordance and you'll have them both in the back of the, you know, their Hebrew and Greek dictionaries are, they're there. They're there for your use. And they're trustworthy. I mean, you know, it's not like Rockies will tell you, oh, what is that? Uh, Thayer's Greek or what? I don't even care about it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Comes from dictionaries, Greek dictionaries and Hebrew dictionaries are exactly that. Here's the Greek word. Here's the Hebrew word. Here's what it means. That's it. Then you take that meaning and you apply that to the text and see how it fits. Sometimes you'll find four or five um, different words that are synonymous in meaning, but different in construct, whatever, you know, um, and, and so whatever. But the point is, is that you go into the original languages and you're going to find out what the original languages say, you know, and I'll say the originals and they'll say, we don't have the originals. I said the languages are original. So you go to the original languages and you study that Hebrew and Greek and what does it say? And then that's when you decide what it means. Um, Gake, ah, that's where your confusion came in. That's right, you mentioned that this morning too. Don't listen to notes. Don't listen to notes, study yourself. Get a diction, a strong concordance, look up the Hebrew, look up the Greek, come to your own conclusions, brother, please. Everyone, come to your own conclusions. When you study the word of God, come to your own conclusions. Look at the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what it means, and then you compare that verse with some other verses and then if you're still not getting a contextual picture and you need to exegete, then exegete the text. Go to the original languages and find out what they mean, what those words mean. You might look, be looking at one word, might describe the whole context for you and adequately answer your question with just one word. But sometimes that word might send you in four or five other directions. It's just expounding upon, trust me, it's not confusion. When you look at the Word of God and you begin to see how interchangeable a lot of Hebrew and Greek words are, and you could use that word here, and oh, you can use that word over there, yeah. And it's amazing, amazing. When you study the original languages, you learn so much more about the scriptures than you will ever learn just reading the English. It's just you know, a matter of fact, just a matter of fact, study the original languages and you'll learn more about God than you've ever imagined you could learn about God. And stay away from Dake's notes, bro, please. Hallelujah. Stay away from Finnish Jennings Dake. His notes are foul, man. His notes are just, he, he has too many aberrant thoughts. He was a gifted man. He was a talented artist. He was a gifted man of God, but he had some issues. He had some serious issues. And so always, always, always chew the meat and spit out the bones, dude. Chew the meat and spit out the bones. If you must read it, then chew the meat and spit out the bones. Take what's good and cast off the rest, man. Spit it out. Ugh, don't want that. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's basically what we are supposed to do. Um, that's being a Berean, you know, that's looking into the text and studying it and making sure what the word of God says, not what somebody else says in their notes. If I trusted modern scholarship, I'd be a confused mess. I'd look like the net Bible. 
calling Dan Wallace every five minutes. Hey, Dr. Wallace, could you help me with this? Yeah, not doing it. Not doing it. So I don't want to, um, you know, belabor the point, but stay away from study Bibles, notes. You don't need them. You know, you can study the word and just look into the original text and that's all you need. He connected Genesis 14, 5, Rephaim with that word. Yeah, saying it was the same word and should have been translated that way. Yeah, well, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. He was wrong because that's not Rephaim, it's Rephaim. They say there's a difference. You got an H, you're spelling with an H, and the word that I looked up is with just a P, it doesn't have the H. There is a difference in, in the pronunciation, okay? And there's a difference in it. And it, 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 it may very well be the difference he was seeing, but they're different words, Rephaim and Rephaim, okay? Different words, okay? So, um, Dake is, you know, that's Dake. That's, I don't mess with Dake. So, done with, done with Dake. I had a Dake study Bible, not the best, not the best. No, I have, uh, yeah, I have a whole lot more going on, so, um, so while we're we're while we're live and kicking, I should just pull these out and show them to you, right? Instead of doing like videos, right? I mean, what do we do, right? So you know me, I like to do things off the cuff. So I'm gonna do it off the cuff. Watch this, right? So we'll do this and So one of the things that um, I found out um, was that uh, um, I don't know um, where I'm at. I really don't know where I'm at. He can, oh, okay. So this is, um, yeah, okay, here he comes. All right, so now I think we're back almost almost up up to snuff here. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll do it like this because this way you can see it. And then I can probably see what's going on here and see how. All right, um, we got, uh, this was um, one of the Bibles that I picked up. It's Black Genuine Leather KJV Thin Line, Omen, hallelujah, wow. And uh, yeah, I'm still a little bit off on the timing. It's just a little bit off. There it is. I think, yeah, so. We're close. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a beautiful little Bible. Um, I just thought it would be like a perfect hand-sized Bible for someone. It's nice, soft. It's a soft leather. It's a genuine leather. They say it's, it, they say it, it, it's, it's um, cowhide, but it's like, this is really, really super treated soft. Um, this is like a really nice, it's a King James version, obviously. I'm not going to buy anything else anymore. Um, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's just text. It's a reader. It's red letter. It's got one ribbon marker. It's a beautiful reader. It's got maps in the back. And it's not edge line, but it's, it's, Vinyl paste down, it's done well. It's, it's a beautiful Bible. It's uh, perimeter stitched. Um, it has tooled hubs. They're not raised, but uh, KJV, King James Version on the spine, you know, um, Holman. They make good Bibles, folks. 
Holman makes really good Bibles, and uh, yeah, amen. Um, that's the one, that's the Holman Bible. That's going to be a giveaway. Yep, Holman Thin Line. Um, here's one that's going to be going up for the giveaway. That one's not. I'm going to show you the Bible anyways. But it's not going to be a giveaway. That one was staying home. This one's going to be going out. This is a KJV Premier Collection. Um, so this is goatskin leather. And of course, yeah, you got your premier collection thing there, whatever. And it's this Bible is beautiful. Now, this has got um, three ribbon markers in it. Um, I'm debating taking out two and leaving just the center one because the other two are just jammed in on top of each other and they just. It just horrible, horrible job. But that's Thomas Nelson. That's what they do. The rest of the Bible is bomb. It's beautiful. It's great Bible. Well built. Uh, five raised hubs on the spine. Um, and uh, the gilding is absolutely beautiful. And it's red under gold art gilt. And it's, again, just text Bible. Um, and now... This is a Bible. These are readers. This is one you carry along with you. It's a reader. Um, and it's an amazing, you know, um, amazing Bible. King James Version Premier Collection. You've seen them before. There's just so many of them. And uh, yeah, great Bible. They'll be, um, I'll be having the giveaway soon. This one, like I said, came. Um, this one was mine. This one has that Tuscany. Um, um, it was called Tuscany, I don't know, Tuscany something, I, had to, I don't even care, I saw it, I said, oh, I gotta have this, this is amazing, and it's got two ribbon markers, it's, you know, um, it's a, it's a Canterbury, I love it, carry along too, I love it, it's gonna be great, um, I haven't even started marking it yet, this one here, one of the reasons why the Bibles are so cheap at BibleStore.com, that's where I've been getting Bibles recently, one of the reasons why they're so cheap is because they're scratch and dents. A lot of them, most of them are scratch and dents, and that's why they can sell them so cheap, because they're making a killing off of a Bible that they paid a dollar for, you know. You buy the pallet for it because they can't sell it, so they sell it to you for a ridiculously little price, and I got a Bible that cost me $10, and I'm going to sell it to you for $150. Oh, my goodness. And I'm doing you a favor by selling it to you for $150 because it's beautiful. What's wrong with it, Pastor Brad? Um, two pages were folded in during the cutting process, and they weren't, they didn't get the dye. They didn't get the gilt. They didn't get the art gilt. So you can see like a white space where the two pages were folded over. When I unfolded the pages, I noticed they didn't have any gilding on them. Ah, okay. They weren't, they, they made it through the cutting process, but then they got folded when it came time to get art gilt. And uh, so the pages have a fold in them. And I can see it was like maybe four or five of them got folded up. And yeah, so I mean, you know, it's fine. Got it fixed up, straightened out. I don't have art gilt. So what? I don't care. I got this because it's a Thompson chain reference. It's the new Thompson chain reference. And I got it because it's just every time I get a Thompson chain reference, I give the Bible away. <laughs> I can't keep a Thompson chain reference in the house. I don't know. I try. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Um, I'm going to try to keep this one nice. This is that roll it up gummy soft. Calfskin. I love that stuff. Yeah, sometimes I'm, sometimes I get asphyxiated with it, and other times I don't care. It's like this one here. Somebody asked me to do a review of a Frederick Scrivener King James Version. And I'm like, well, Hendrickson sells a little pocket version of it. Uh, this is Frederick Scrivener's work. and uh, But this one was a bonded leather one with no, it wasn't Smithsonian or nothing. So I made it Smithsonian. I took it and I drilled holes in the Bible 
I took my drill, I drilled holes through, and then I put this cloth string, looped it through, and it's like every other um, stitch, it's looped through, and, but this thing here, never fall apart now. You couldn't pull this Bible apart if you wanted to. I could pull it tight, and I can see the string in there. It's Smithsonian, hallelujah. I like it, good stuff. I could have looped it through again a second time and made it full. I don't know much about, I know how to sew. I'm good with sewing, but I don't know the technical terms for sewing and stitches and I don't know. Um, yeah, my wife used to love watching that stuff on Create. So yeah, amen. So that's that. That's not a giveaway Bible. These are, these two of these um, four Bibles are giveaway Bibles. This might eventually become a giveaway Bible. We'll see how this works out. I don't know. I, I don't mark these Bibles up. I do look at them for a while. I do examine them. I do, you know, um, yeah. But um, these are definitely uh, um, going to be next two to be going out. So, yep, we'll see. We'll work out how we're going to do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, amen. So, um, remember, um, every once in a while, I like to let everybody come and everybody get, be a part of it. Um, but uh, for the most part, I like to make the Bibles for new um, followers, people that have, you know, been with us but haven't won a Bible yet. Uh, and relatively new subscribers. So if you're a new subscriber or relatively new and haven't won a Bible from us yet, you'll be able to get into these next uh, few giveaways. The next few giveaways are going to be for new um, subscribers only. Um, only because uh, um, it doesn't make any sense for me to... Um, keep sending you Bibles if I've sent you, you know, 10 Bibles already. Um, that, that's not what God called me to do. I'm not spreading the word of God like that. All I'm doing is fattening up your library. Uh, mine's looking emaciated. No, <laughs> mine's just fine. I have stuff in my library that I won't ever give away. So, um, but yeah, amen. The Lord is good. I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to give the things that we can give. And so that's what we'll be doing next up. We'll be doing a Bible giveaway probably uh, another week or so, it looks like. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Um, yeah. Keep us in prayer. And just um, I'm waiting to see what's going on with this uh, doctor's visit for my neck. I got a lot of stuff to do before they actually do the surgery. Um, I was hoping they would just say, you know what, we see it. Yeah, we're just going to go in there and fix it. Um, I got to get, something's got to be done because I got a lot of nerve pain. You don't even know the half of it right now. Um, yeah, that truck rocked me, man. So uh, I'm thankful for um, God's grace and mercy. I'm still alive. Hallelujah. Um, I said, Somebody asked me how I was doing today. I uh, walked in the store. How are you doing today? And I says, uh, every day above ground is a good day. It's a good day. I'm on this side of the grass. Yep. Amen. Hallelujah. A amen. So I'm thankful. God is good. He's been continuously hallelujah, good to us. Um, and so we want to share in that. Um, so why do you give premium Bibles? Because if I have one and I want one, why can't you, you know, why shouldn't you? Um, and then if I'm able to give one or two away, you know, why shouldn't I give a good one? You know, I'm not going to give you, um, a bonded leather Bible. That's, you know, you're gonna rip it up inside of six months. No, I want to give you a Bible that's going to last you a lifetime. Hallelujah. So, you know, here it is, you know. Um, so I sent one accidentally to someone else. Um, I told him, keep it. 
give it to somebody. And he told me somebody was actually asking him about a King James Version Bible. I said, well, there it is then. Give it up. And so, yeah, the brother's going to give it away. And that's good. I thank the Lord for that. Um, thank the Lord for the privilege of uh, being able to give. And as you give, that's how you're going to receive. Remember that. As you give, the way you give, that's the way you're going to receive. It's not name it, claim it. It's Bible 101, Jesus. You know, give and it shall be given unto you. With the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Those are his words. That's his words. So how do you want to receive? The way you want to receive is the way you give. Remember, I, that's why I live by Luke 6.38. This ministry functions by Luke 6.38. Hallelujah. Give and it shall be given to you. That's how we function. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. I can't even tell you how many times I've been down in the pit and the Lord dug me out. The Lord dug me out and he did it with people like you. You watching this video and you've helped. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you you watching this video and you helped us in the past thank you god bless you hallelujah um the only thing we ever asked for i, I could like i said a lot of people ask me why i don't do it I, I don't i don't want nobody telling me what i can and can't say that's why i don't ask for money i don't solicit funds i solicit bibles you got a, a stack of premium bibles like this one at home and you want to you got like a wall full of them and they're all stacked up like this on your shelf. You know, and you want to give give me two? Give me one. Give me two. Hallelujah. If you want to send a box of, you know, a dozen Bibles because you got them like that, you know, then fine. Send me a box. But you want to send us a Bible? That's great. Send us a Bible. Um, we give good Bibles away. We give good quality Bibles away. Because that's what I that's what I want to do. Um, so that's what I do, and uh, that's what we do. We've been doing it for a long time, and we're going to keep doing it, even though um, she's not helping anymore. Um, hallelujah, she's still helping. So she's uh, she's talking to me. I listen. I can hear her. Hallelujah. When I when I pray and I ask the Lord to speak to me, Hallelujah. I can I can hear my wife praying. Hallelujah. I just hear her. I can, it's like I can hear her like she's still sitting here. I'm just amazed. I'm thankful. God is so good. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful. But I'm thankful for the voice of God that I hear through his word and through his word. Amen. Through his word alone. Hallelujah. I listen for that still small voice of God. And I love the smell of calfskin leather. Yeah, I'm one of those guys too. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I love the smell of leather. Oh, leather Bibles, man. It's like the, the cow is mooing. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Jesus. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. We're good. Um, Jeannie, yeah, they probably were not expect. You were probably expecting a Mark Ward. We have to do another video. I need to do the next two. Let's see. I and I need to do them. Let's look at them. Why don't we look at them? Let's go to Mark Ward. Um, Mark Ward's War on Words, right? Let's do it, because I know Jeannie was, I think that's what she was talking about in the beginning. And uh, you sat around for an hour or more just listening to me babble about this guy here. Um, Mark Wards, War on Words. Where are you? No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't need to do that. Mark Ward, let's see. Uh, 50, yeah, 50 false friends. 50 false friends in the KJV. Mark Ward's 50 false friends in the KJV. Here they are. And now, see, I get this list. 
I get this list, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I get this list, and this is how I follow, you know, his words. Um, and we were going to look at meat and cattle, all right? So let's look at this video. Over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, the thing that you might notice mm. is that it seems kind of odd for God to... We did meat and cattle. That was the one we did, the last one we did. The next one was miserable versus pitiable. We're going to do a little analysis and critique today. We are going to listen to the story of a defender of the exclusive use of the King James Version who gets tripped up by a false friend. Remember. All right, so his friend of uh, the, let's see, 50 false friends. So let's go back here. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Now this should pop up because I'm so this is something different. All right, subscriptions library. Here we go. There it is. Miserable versus pitiable. False friend. Remember, a false friend is three things. It's a word in King James English that we still use today. It's a word we use differently than did the Elizabethans back then. And it's a word where that difference is unlikely to be noticed by contemporary English readers. It's a false friend because we read right past it, not realizing that we are misunderstanding it. Among the many videos on YouTube promoting the exclusive use of the King James Version, now, I'm, this is where his assumption becomes the mother of all confusion. I'm going to use those words, right? His assumption is that we all just read right past it. And we don't, but then I got guys like Colin here that don't miss a beat. You know, and catch every word. So, you know, that's good. That's, that's the way I want you to be, you know look at every word and, and, and see every word and, and sometimes just a phrase and, but, you know, pray for discernment and ask the Lord to help you to, you know, see what you're reading. And so that you don't just read along just to read along. You know, uh, my wife used to question everything. And that's, I miss about her the most man. in the morning, man. She used to question everything that I read. But listen to them now. The rejection of all contemporary translations. There is one video that has nearly 60,000 views as of right now, which is more views than my entire channel put together. It's a well-known speaker speaking to a very large audience at a well-known church that has its own Christian college. I very nearly showed you a clip of this uh, talk, but I don't want to make this video into a debate about personalities. And I don't want to pick on an individual for making a silly mistake that we all make. And one I don't blame him or us for making. Simply put, in his defense of the King James Version, he got tripped up by a false friend that would trip up every one of us. He told a story about hearing a man preach out of a version other than the King James Version. This other preacher cited 1 Corinthians 15, 19 in his sermon. But when he came to that memorable phrase, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, the preacher read, we are of all men most pitiable. This King James only brother, a leader in the King James only world, heard this and thought, that isn't right, it's miserable, not pitiable. And I thought the modern versions were supposed to make reading easier, not harder. And pitiable isn't a word everyone knows, but miserable sure is. This defender and promoter of KJV onlyism used this story as an argument against the use of contemporary English translations. They say they make reading easier, but actually sometimes they make it harder. That was his point. I think he raises a good question. Why indeed do modern translators use the word pitiable when miserable is easier? Are they trying to avoid infringing on the King James's crown copyright in Britain? No. Are they just introducing variation for variation's sake? No again. Are they using a different underlying Greek text? No. 
There is no variation here. So why are they doing this? It's because miserable in this passage, in the King James Version, is a false friend. That doesn't mean miserable is a false friend everywhere in the King James, but it is here. And it's the kind of false friend you can't notice through contextual conflict. There's simply nothing in the context of 1 Corinthians 15 in the King James to indicate that the word meant something different in 1611. Our modern sense of miserable makes perfect sense in this context. The only way you can notice this false friend is the way our King James only brother did, through noticing that a contemporary translation uses a different word. Unwittingly, and we've all done this, he stumbled into step one of my five-step process for discerning false friends in the King James. He noticed a possible false friend through, in this case, not a contextual conflict, but through checking another translation against his will. But he stopped there. He assumed the King James was right and didn't pursue further. I say humbly that my brother should have gone to step two once he got the chance back in his study. Before repeating this story to a very large audience in support of the basic point that we should all use only the King James, he should have, number two, looked up the underlying Hebrew or Greek word in a responsible original language lexicon. And this is what he would have seen. Pertaining to being deserving of sympathy for one's pathetic condition, miserable, pitiable. People who know Greek might notice that this word is related to the word mercy. Again, in other words, this is focusing not on somebody's feeling internally, but on how they ought to be regarded. See what he's got here? Okay. He has a, he has a, um, Modern critical text, Greek, Hebrew, Greek lexicon, and he has um, modern critical text manuscripts mentioned right here in the um, in the apparatus. Um, he also has, bear in mind, he, he works for ESV now, Crossway, so he has access to all of their modern critical text manuscripts, um, Nestle Alon 28th, and uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, he probably uses, uh, he probably uses uh, Robinson Pierpont as well. But he's he's now he's not just he's not just Byzantine text form anymore. Now Mark Ward is modern critical text, and Mark Ward goes after this um, verse. Let me see this where he's going. First Corinthians fifteen nineteen in his sermon. But when he came to that memorable phrase. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The First preacher read. Corinthians 15, 19 is the word, right? So 1 Corinthians 15, 19 is the word, right? Amen. And so we want, we, we go to the King James Version. Hallelujah, and I'll just do the online one because it's quicker. First uh, Corinthians um, 15 and 19. Amen, hallelujah. So he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pit miserable, most miserable, and... Um, that's what the 1611 translators put most miserable. Um, and modern critical text says most pitiable. Uh, and so you just look at the original Greek and it's Ele Aino Teroi. Ele Aino Teroi. All right. And it just means miserable. Period just means miserable. It's from the Greek eleinos, the root eleinos, and it just means pitiable or miserable. And of course, miserable being, yeah, man, I pity you, man. You know, I pity the soul that is as broken and hurting as, you know, that one. Or, uh, you know, it's a miserable, most miserable position. Um, and uh, 
of course, when you look at the text, uh, when you look at the text in context, what is he talking about? 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the spirit realm and and the new life and 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 what it's like in the spirit realm, right, as opposed to the natural realm. Um, um, he used. Uh, um, yeah, we are of all all men most miserable, right? It's miserable. Just a miserable feeling, right? It's miserable. If in this life we're of all men most if this is all that you have, wow. And that's what he was talking about, because he was talking about the spirit realm. And uh, I use First Corinthians 15 often to argue with Seventh day Adventist man about, you know, soul sleep. And often, you know, because the promise is that we're going to have a new life and it's something to look forward to. It's not, uh, there's no hope if I'm just going to sleep. If I'm just going to sleep, then get it over with. Get it over with. What's the sense? Why drag it out? Get it over with. I want to go to bed. I want to go to bed and hopefully when I wake up, you know, everything will be hunky-dory, right? No, I don't, you know. I get enough sleep. I don't want to sleep. I want to one time gone and leave this life, man, wasted half of this life on sleep. Sleep is a waste of time. I hate sleep. I do. I wish I could just keep going forward and forward, man, because sleep is a waste of time. I mean, that's just my opinion. Um, so, um, you know, L.A. Inos I mean, you know, really, come on, Mark, how do you not see that? How do you not see that? And why would you even try to change that? That doesn't make sense. So that's like one of his false friends that I just don't even get it. Ella Inos, you know, um, pitiable, miserable. What's the problem? What's the problem? And he, you know, he, he goes on and on and on talking about all these words and all of these you know, uh, phrases, and he talks about Greek tense and things of that nature. And sometimes tense has something to do with it. Sometimes tense can change the meaning of the word because it just, it, that's how it works. Sometimes tense has a lot to do with it. Most times or not, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, the words, certain words have, um, of have have finite meaning certain words have descriptive meaning um and, and greek is a picture language it's like it's like i can get up close and take the camera and snap a picture of my face up close and all you'll see is my nose and you'll be like well what's that well that's a nose pastor brett no, I don't know. It just looks like a nose. But then I step back here, and you take a picture of me now, and you say, oh, that's Pastor Brett. And you can see what's going on in Pastor Brett's life and what's happening with Pastor Brett. Man, look, he needs a maid and all the, all the other stuff. Right? See, you can see more. Now the picture's like, oh, look at that. Wow, hey, cool, right? Um, yeah, it's, that's how Greek is. Hebrew as well, they're picture languages. One word can, like, say it all. So study the words, Colin. Study the words, everyone. Um, Psalms 127.2, sleep is a gift from God. Yeah, I know. I, I know. But I still think it's a waste. It's a waste of time. I don't know. I think it's a waste of time. Unless, of course, I'm dreaming and he's speaking to me in a, you know, a dream, then it's great. Yeah, I know it's necessary. I get it. I sleep. I get my sleep. Sometimes I get more than I need. Sometimes I don't get enough. Ooh. But that was an easy one, Mark. So Mark Ward's 50 false friends are starting to be um, easy, too easy to understand. It, it's getting to the point where I knew what I was going to encounter when I began to study these words. 
when the first time I looked at them and, and just, I went through them quickly and I was like, what's the problem? Why are you even trying to change any of this? Why do you think any of this needs to be changed? Why do you call it a false friend? I know what he means by false friends and everything, but he's gone crazy with this. He's gone crazy with this. His book took off and his book is selling, you know, like hotcakes and he's making money off of his book and, and they're not false friends. They're not false friends. The 50 um, faithful friends that Mark Ward keeps calling false. Um, I should write a book like that and redo all this in a book. The 50 um, faithful friends that Mark Ward considers false. Oh, I wonder. That would be good. What do you think? <laughs> Should I do it? That would be something, right? Um, there's someone, someone out there that knows how to, like, um, get a book done and get a book printed and get it done and get it printed. And I need to get in touch with that person. Um, and, uh, um, but he needs to get into a place where he can do what he does best on the computer. And right now he can't. So, so I'm waiting for him. I'm waiting for him to get, you know, out of where he is and over to where his wife is. And when he gets over to where his wife is, then we'll be good. I'll be able to, uh, maybe, um, get a book published. Um, uh, I don't know what, where to start, once to start, I mean, you know, the, the content of the book, it's all here, getting it down, uh, it, it, we don't do it the way we do it, it used to do it years ago, you used to do it on paper, you know, you had to write a manuscript, and uh, now all you can do is just talk to a recorder, you know, and just tell it, you know, and then they'll edit it, you know, and grammar and everything else and before you know it you got a book the 50 faithful friends in the king james version that mark ward considers false yeah that'll be good that'll be good yeah yeah i took my baby shopping today and i should have took her i should have went and got some juice while i was there I bought some things I needed and forgot to buy some things that I needed. So, yeah, maybe I'll take a walk around the corner, go to the store. I wonder if I could walk to the store. I could probably make it around the corner. That might be a good thing to do. Colin, 127.2. Oh, sleep is a gift from God. Yeah. Amen, brother. Hey, listen, I hope that was a help to you. Um, Mark Ward's 50 false friends are starting to look like pretty faithful friends to me. Um, I'm thankful. Um, yeah, hope that helps. And uh, yeah, Jeannie, thanks for the reminder. Um, I should, uh, I'm going to do all of his 50 false friends. Uh, I think I'm through so far um, eight. I think I've gone through eight of his false friends. Maybe more, um, but uh, amen. God is good, hallelujah. And I'm thankful for his grace and mercy. Um, he did that four years ago. He looked like a young man in that video. He looks, um, he looks seasoned now when you look at him. A little more chunkier, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Um, Next 10 KJV words you don't know, you don't know. Debunking every major Bible contradiction in 26 minutes. minutes. Answer in Genesis. Answers in Genesis. Oh, okay. Uh, 10 KJV words you don't know, you don't know. 50 false friends in the KJV. Oh, I don't know. That's uh, next in the queue. Oh, that's Mark Ward. Um, okay, so, amen. Um, yeah, and he's got like a join button. If you hit the join button, you can, he can get paid. He's getting paid. I don't you know, he's getting paid. I don't know. Um, I don't know. 
I could do that because I'm once you get over a thousand subscribers, you become like, you know, YouTube wants to use your channel to make money, you know, and you can make money off of it. I haven't done it. I haven't done it because I don't want nobody telling me what to preach. I don't want anybody telling me what I should do or how I should do it. I want no YouTube creators telling me, well, you know, you really should do this because I really don't want to. I just want to preach the gospel. So all I want to do is preach the gospel. I want to talk about the things that concern the church and the things that are encouraging to you and edifying to you. And that's what we're going to do here on this channel. And we're just going to continue to be about Jesus and not about the world. Amen. So uh, I hope that's cool with you because that's the way we're going to do it. Hallelujah. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, I appreciate you coming and hanging out with the, um, hanging out with the likes of me. Thank you, Jesus. Um, Colin says, is Wilson's Old Testament um, word studies a good source? Um, no. No, it's not. Get a good source, get a strong concordance. You need one? Let me know. If you need one, I'll, uh, I'll help you get one. But get a strong concordance and study the original words. That's it. Study the original words. Look up, and you can't, and why is strong concordance? Because it's got the best Hebrew and Greek dictionaries in the, on the market, number one. Number two, they're lexical aids. They are lexical aids. All right, all right, and and then um, every word and every usage in the King James version is in the Strong's Concordance. So you're not going to find, you know, some words like maybe ten of the most important. You're going to find every word and every usage of the King James Version of the Bible is in the Strong's Concordance. You can't, if you can't find it, think of a different word in the verse. If you still can't find it, he said, then you wouldn't recognize it if it bit you. <laughs> I mean, and it was like, he didn't say that exactly word for word verbatim, but he pretty much said it. It was a pretty bold statement. He said, if you can't find it, he said, then it's you're the problem. It's not not the not the concordance. Um, because every word and every usage is in that concordance. And so I thought that that was amazing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Colin, don't don't look to you know, don't look to helps to words. Just go study the words, man. Study the words. And write down notes in your wide margin Bible. You got a wide margin Bible? Write your notes, man. That's what I do with my wide margin. I write the notes down. I see a word, hmm, I write the notes. I got to get Pigma Micron pens. I keep forgetting to go and get Pigma Micron pens. I should have went out today. I could have went out. I had enough time. I might still have enough time, but it'll be late. I don't know. Hmm. I forgot. I don't have a car. My car's in the shop. And they haven't called me today. So they better call me tomorrow. They've had my car two days now. He asked me if it was all right to have this car. Can you go without it for a couple of days? And I said, yeah, maybe one or two days, but not, not more than that. Now, tomorrow will be day three. So the car should be done, hopefully. We'll see. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, I'm going to uh, guess I'm going to say good night. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thanks for watching, everybody. Jesus loves you. We love you. And uh, come back again. <laughs> and maybe we'll do something a little bit more exciting. Maybe we'll do a Bible giveaway. Have a great evening, everyone. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.